Everybody, welcome back to another fine week of the uh, Snap No Tap podcast. We are without Nico and Davina. Unfortunately, once again, I believe he's working tied up. Um, we do have a special guest, a very special guest that we're going to get to in a moment. And he's from the amateur wrestling world predominantly. You'll, you'll hear his whole story. Um, I've never met him, but we, we met today, just a few, like maybe 30 minutes ago. We actually had to restart this podcast because we had some technical difficulties um but you guys didn't come to hear me you guys didn't actually come to hear anybody you actually came to look at joe the greatest looking man that ever lived cardinal and here he is take it away you know that's right tony actually that's one of the, the grave concerns about being interested in the martial arts and having the looks i have is that i'm always putting them at risk there's always that conflict of you know do you take your most valuable asset and put it in risk and that's how much i care about the arts that i'm willing to do that to advance the arts and, well you're uh, a human work of art you're you know that you're just a giant come to life work of art so well, i'm just trying to say like would you take the mona lisa and put it on the mats no you know so you have to be careful with that's that's the conflict that i deal with every day you know so not every grappler has to deal with these concerns you know like you're so, clearly you don't so um no, but anyways, you know, speaking of, I think it, happy Halloween, everybody. Uh, we're recording on Halloween day, and that might be part of why we're getting, uh, you know, getting the heebie-jeebies here and having to, to uh, record multiple times here and having glitches. So maybe we're being spooked a little bit on this show. Uh, but before we get into talking to Blaine Beal, wrestling out of Iowa, um, uh, we'd like to do our plugs, of course. So uh, the big news is, obviously, we're, we've got a retirement date for the uh, Tri-C program. There's only two spots left. Um, the Tri-C program, obviously, if you're looking for uh, authentic catch wrestling and boxing training, uh, you can't look anywhere better. And the Tri-C program gives you the best access to Tony uh, and his uh, materials. You get instant access to all his videos. Um, you get basically a lifetime membership as Tony is your coach. So whether it's coming to his house and training in person or uh, doing Zoom lessons, uh, that entitles you to all of that. And then such a big uh, commitment on Tony's end, that's in part why we're limiting the number that's available and why we're kind of sunsetting it. Uh, so obviously everybody who's joined up already is, is still, that commitment's there from Tony for life, but uh, you know, all good things must come to an end. At least the opportunity to join is coming yeah. to an end. To and be it's clear. technically Zoom Zoom lessons, although there can be now and then it's all, that would be included. But generally, it's just distance learning where you film something on your schedule. Because, you know, I train with the Tri-C. There's people from all over the world, literally all over. And obviously, you can't most of the time cannot do anything live because of the time differences. Um, but, yeah, you get both. You get it's not in, it's not even an either or. Well, either I come to Chicago or I do the distance. It's both. It's either either, you know, you can get them both. Uh, so, yeah, after 15 years, we're retiring it. Finally, January 31st is the last day, no matter what. Or on, or uh, earlier, if I fill these last two spots. So really. I'm I'm looking for the last two people to join. Um, and the sooner you join, the sooner we can get started, close it up, and move on to another program that will not be anywhere near as encompassing as the Tri-C. It just won't. And like Joe was alluding to, part of it is just the, the time consumption, and there's other things as well. But the bottom line is, uh, you, you'll, yes, you'll get the instant downloads to all of my products. And for those guys who've actually already bought those products, there's a lot of people who have, they have my complete catch wrestling. If you're still interested in learning, the Tri-C, write me, so email me, and, um, you know, you'll get a different price. 
Uh, you won't have to pay the full price because you already have the DVDs or the, uh, well, some may have the DVDs, some may have the digital downloads. So uh, the biggest thing is, and here I'm going to sound like a, a salesman. I should probably use my salesman voice. Hello, America. Hello, world. No, seriously, you're going to, if you, there will be nothing after January 31st. So don't sit back there and kind of regret it. Like, oh man, I should have done it because this is not a bluff in any way, shape or form. I'm not going to like redo it. Um, you know, so really jump on it when you can. Um, and there has been a couple of people that have emailed me just, you know, asking some questions. And I think they should know, uh, cause I did mention it to them. It is first come first serve. So, uh, yeah, like for example, if two people sign up right now, that's it. When I when I get the notice of it, I'll I'll make an announcement that it's all over. Um, but yeah, and uh, it's been a long haul. As I said, 15 years. We had our first sign up ever. Paul Dodds was on the podcast here a couple of two three months ago from from uh, Newcastle, uh, England. I'm going to miss the opportunity to get to know some people, but I'll probably still have some sort of training for people from around the world, some sort of distance training. I'm sure I will, but it won't be the Tri-C. It won't be lifetime. Uh, it will not be that as encompassing. Um, we're going to work out the details. We, for sure, we'll, we'll have something launched uh, at the beginning of 2022, but it, this is it. This is your only chance of getting fully certified, uh, which is really important. And um, yep, and it's all custom lessons. That's the beautiful thing. Nothing is prepackaged. You get my DVD or my video downloads, but those are for reference only. You get custom made. Like, so for example, our guest here today, that Brian or that uh, uh, Joel introduced, he's got such a strong amateur wrestling background. So I'm not gonna, if he was in a Tri-C, well, I'm not gonna sit there and say, okay, this is the wrestling stance. This is how you change your level. This is the penetration step. You know, I'm not, I wouldn't have to go through that with him. I would augment what, are your, what he already has, add the strikes or say, hey, you're vulnerable to this move. Watch out for this. Let's get those submissions going. Let's change strategies. So this is the beautiful thing about a program like this. So he wouldn't have to start at square one, uh, you know, uh, a cowboy stance or a staggered stance or, you know, uh, level changes and shit. We, we don't, you know. Um, and because of that, because everything is customized to the person, I, I can't take a lot of students. I, I could never have a, a thousand students. Believe me, I'd be retired now if I could have had a thousand students, but it's small niche. So you, you, you're going to be in a very, very tiny exclusive club, uh, really, if you want to look at it like that. And it is a shame that it's ending, uh, but you know, but all good things must come to an end, except for Joe's looks, because that's eternal. But that, his looks, will, even when he passes away, He'll look better than us three days dead. We know that. Well, so that's, Joe, another, uh, that's another value of this podcast is at least we are recording the, my looks for posterity. So it's another service, another public service we are doing for the future. Yeah. Um, but, you know, real quick, I know we've kind of went on along about the Tri-C, although it's important because we're retiring it. I do want to plug some of our uh, schools of our friends, basically, friends of us. Um, if the you're looking, yeah. And um, so... If you're looking for authentic Muay Thai instruction, uh, you can't do better uh, in the Chicagoland area than the Akai Training Center uh, run by head instructor Rick Solo. He's been a guest on this show. I've known him for a long, long time. He spent many decades traveling back and forth to Thailand. Uh, he's the real deal. And uh, just look him up. And it's just it's ridiculous that you can get access to him at such affordable prices. Um, also on the north side, actually not too far from Rick's gym. Uh, if you're looking for jujitsu instruction, and now actually they offer judo classes, um, they have a black belt in judo there, uh, and now they also do striking, is uh, Jason Bender, Bender Martial Arts, so look that up, that's in the Andersonville neighborhood, uh, you can't, can't do uh, better than going to him for your grappling needs, and then lastly for nogi jujitsu, or nogi grappling, as I think he likes to call it, is uh, Josh Bassini, uh, training on the northwest side of Chicago, uh, 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu. All great guys. We've had them here. You can definitely listen to their interviews uh, to get a vibe for them, but uh, just all, like I said, get our solid endorsement. And lastly, uh, for those who cannot afford, you know, some of the 
price your training options. Uh, at least show your gratitude. Join our monthly membership. There's a $5 like pra- Patreon level just showing thank you for the podcast and for the free lessons on uh, YouTube. And then there's a $10 level uh, where uh, you get an additional videos that we're, we're right now still creating new videos and releasing those only to the membership at the $10 level. So those are different from what's available on Tony's site that you can download. Uh, as I was saying earlier, as we were trying to record this, my shins are still sore from yesterday's recording as we went through shin locks um, and some of the finer details there is how to execute those. So those are uh, great details and things that you have access to for literally $10 a month. So that's like next to nothing for getting some good information. So after all of that, we'd like to get to our uh, the guest for today, Blaine Beal, a uh, wrestler out of Iowa. Now, Blaine, uh, you know, we obviously started talking about this before, but you come from an athletic family, it sounds like. You're, both your parents were athletes, is that correct? Yeah, uh, father was big football, um, and my uh, mother was softball. Yeah, and they were pretty one sport athletes in the sense that they've done, they probably dabbled a little bit in all of them. But as far as what I remember and what they cared to divulge to me, it was pretty much softball, football, uh, not a whole lot of wrestling. And honestly, when they found out I wanted to wrestle, I wasn't very good at it. And so um, they nicely, as parents do say, are you sure this is what you want to do? I mean, you don't seem to be really good at it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, that's coming from getting pinned uh, uh, every first match every the whole season I was in there I was pinned every match um yeah but I said no I, I really like it it's really good so kept with it now you were saying earlier like I said I talked so I know some of these details but it was uh uh no pun intended but the thing that hooked you was a cross face is that right yeah yeah, uh, my buddy, uh, uh, Justin Bells, uh, he was a guy who did AAU. His dad was big wrestler. They, there's a lineage of that. And he had done wrestling for a long time. And we were down in my grandmother's basement. And he was like, oh, hey, we're goofing around. And he threw a leg in, cross-faced me. And he's about 30, 40 pounds lighter than me. So I just remember my pride getting the shot more than my face did. And I kind of was, uh, uh, this is never happening again. I need to start wrestling so that I can pretzel him up. So. Um, and I, I dwarfed him at, at the end of it. So I think he never got that chance again. So <laughs> <laughs> good for you. Good for you. Yeah. Sorry, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting. So you didn't have success right away. You said you really struggled initially. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was definitely something that, uh, it was, it was just frustrating, but the, just the aspect of, I had done, done team sports, you know, basketball, um, football, uh, did a little bit of swimming. That's a more individualized, but you can't have a team aspect of it, obviously. But um, I love that it was all on me. Um, and the only way you could stop feeling the hurt from losing was to just get better. So yeah, I was pinned almost every match my first, my first season out. And then it went to, I was still losing, but I didn't give up a pin. And uh, then it just blossomed just one step at a time, little goals for myself to eventually start doing some, turning some heads and uh, uh, putting people on back, on their back. So it was fun. That's really good. That says something because it's hard to stick with something. I mean, anybody who's involved in, in the combat sports uh, and, you know, repeatedly gets their, their butt handed to them. That's not a fun thing. You know, you've really got to have a commitment and a, and a passion for it. We were talking a little bit about that, that it's almost like, uh, well, would you say that's like, like you said, at some point you were literally addicted, regardless of what happened? Yeah, no, without question. Um, I mean, one of my first, uh, I have a VCR, right? I was on the turn of the century when VCRs turned to uh, <laughs> DVDs, but I had a combo TV VCR and uh, in my I was about ninth grade when I first got it. And I just had nothing but um, Kara McCoy. Kerry McCoy wrestling. And I just remember watching his just, uh, it was just on a loop. And the beautiful thing is I'd fall asleep watching it, but these, the old school, uh, they would automatically rewind and then start replaying again. So I'd, you know, I'd be sleeping all of a sudden I'd wake up at three o'clock in the morning and then I'd be like, Oh, and then watch it a little bit more until I fell asleep, you know, like, so I definitely became um, uh, just, yeah, it's a good word to say, but addicted to it for sure. You know, in a way, you're lucky to. Well, it sounds like because you 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 use the technology to your to your benefit, but you came along in the in the tech age. You know, when I was a kid, you know, we didn't have any of that, so there was yeah. no 
no videos to watch of anything, like any instructional videos or I heard, now I don't know this, um, but I, I heard there was like movies available. Yeah, but you had to have like an actual, like a small movie projector at the house. I mean, who has that? You know, no, nobody had that. So um, right. yeah, that's good that even back then when you were in ninth grade, you were taking advantage of the, uh, of the technology and you were following, uh, you know, a phenomenal wrestler, you know, so yeah, that's, yeah. that's awesome. There were a couple other ones, but as far as heavyweights goes, I mean, I had Steve Mako, I had Kerry McCoy, I had some other instructional videos to watch, but, you know, Dan Gable, uh, at the end of the day, his fundamentals are unparalleled for sure, but I felt like I, I really gravitated towards the taller, the lankier, and the more explosive heavyweights, so I tried to align myself with watching more videos on that kind of body style, and Kerry McCoy is obviously um, one that I just, just sticks out constantly, so. Now, was it a gradual progression for you or you start to slightly see more success or was there just a year where it's like all of a sudden it hit and you were. It was definitely one year. Um, so, so my freshman year in high school, I was not the studious of uh, people. I actually was kicked off the wrestling team three times um, <laughs> in one year. And the reason why I say three times and I still continue because um, as a freshman, I was on the team um, and my grades were, you know, two F's and you couldn't be on a sports team. I had two F's. I had two F's. And the guy go and the coach, Coach Olsen said, you got to leave. Can't be on the team anymore. So he kicked me out of the practice. It was one of the things, you know, you sit there in the beginning of practice. He goes over things. And then he's like, oh, we just got report cards. You kicked off. Blaine, yada, 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 yada. You got to leave. And a um, couple, the next day I came back to practice. He didn't notice. And, you know, <laughs> rightly so, rightly so. You got your freshman coach, you got your sophomore coach, and you got your varsity coach. He was the head varsity coach. So, really, he had other things going on. We had a big wrestling room. So, I just snuck back in line and got back <laughs> into wrestling and just continued. A week goes by, and he goes, wait a minute. Aren't you supposed to be off the team? And I go, yeah. And he goes, no, you can't practice. So, you left. Came back the next day. And just <laughs> I just kept on. I just kept on until finally the last time. He's like, just whatever. Just sit in the corner. Just go ahead. You're going to keep coming back. Just whatever. And I'm like, I don't need, you know, at that point, I wasn't allowed to compete. But in my mind, I was like, who cares? I, I, I'm learning. I'm getting a role. I'm getting a wrestle. So I don't care if I don't compete. Uh, I'm here. So and then that summer, I, uh, along with. Uh, various other things that happened in my sophomore year to kind of turn my physical or my uh, mental aspect of really getting more studious around. I, uh, I just started doing open mats, just going to this school, that school, my school wasn't known for wrestling or sports really. So we didn't really have any off season wrestling, but we had a lot of other schools in the area that offered it. So I just was a nomad. I just rolled around to everybody else's open mats and, uh, just tried to learn as much as I could. And that's kind of that sophomore year just kind of took off. And I started doing better and better, getting my first couple of varsity matches as a sophomore. And then progressively being a two-time state placer uh, my junior and senior year at high school. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah, it was you definitely like immediate. So I just love that story that they tell you, uh, you're off the team, you're like, okay. And then you just still come back. I mean, that shows well, that life puts obstacles because so many times there's obstacles to training you know whether it's your family or what have you you know and um uh there are just certain individuals who you know they, they're not going to take no for an answer you know it's like that's the old, like the beginning of a great career as being a stalker you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'd learned it from police you know uh every breath you take i just uh, played it over and over again no. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> yeah yeah no, well, you know, there are people who, who, who just, yeah, they're, it's a crossroads and some, some other people would have probably said, well, that's it. You know, life's working against me and I could have been a great wrestler, but you know, they, you know, the hell with it. You didn't take that approach. You're like, so what? I'll work through this. I'll get around this. I think at one point I just, I, I've always had the mentality, um, prove something, not necessarily to anybody in general, but to myself that you just, just. I can always be better that I remember, I don't know if it was a grandparent or if it was a, my, one of my parents that told me that there's always someone that's going to be working harder than you. Um, and I took that as a challenge instead of an absolution. And I, I just tried to kind of live it and just kind of be like, well, somebody else would do that. 
somebody else would. So why not you? Why can't you do it if somebody else would do it? You know, like why not be an equal? So you're always chasing some fictitious person that's that that you know that reverse Blaine or the Bizarro Blaine that's just one, just a little bit stronger, you know. And so I'm obviously self motivated as best as I can. So I think that's good, and you're and you're probably self analytical too. You can probably look at yourself and say, man, you know, I'll just make something up. Well, man, my double leg or my, you know, my tie ups need work. You know, some people aren't. They're kind of narcissistic. They're like, no, I'm good. I'm real good. I, yeah, I, yeah. I don't think you're like that. I think you probably always want to look at yourself and see how you can improve, right? Yeah, correct. I mean, there's always there's always room for improvement. That's why I, it's almost like a figure skater. Like, you're never going to get a 10. You're never going to get a 10. It's always going to be a 9.2, 9.5. 9. There's always going to be that 10, that, that, that gold medal that you're going to reach. It's just, it's always just can be yanked. So it's never an absolution. So I, I try to always have that attitude. So your junior and senior year in high school, you're starting to do really well, starting to compete at the state level, uh, and that, that sets the stage for your college career. So uh, where did you decide to go to school, and how did that play out? Um, so my so my senior year, our head coach had actually stepped down, and a new coach came in. His name is Pat Ryle, and uh, one of the first or the first solid wrestling coach and coach in general that I'd ever had. It just just a a great human being. Um, he really kind of led me into my uh, coach that I finished out with in college, Schwab, that I'll, I'll, I'll talk in a little bit, but he, um, he had an investment. It wasn't like friends, but it was, I'm your coach. You're my student, you know, and I was actually on, they pulled me in to do the interval interview my senior year, because the year before I was a, I was a uh, um, state placer and the only one that was returning from the, I was the youngest state placer. So I was going into my senior year as the team captain. So they wanted me to come in and sit in on the interview process. And I just remember liking him a lot. He just brought a little bit of a different attitude towards it. Um, and probably the fact that I was on the, asked to be on the interview committee and accepted it, like probably got him excited as seeing, oh, one of the athletes is actually sitting in on the interview. This is great. So um, he definitely helped mold me to, aspirate to go to bigger and better things which is d1 college wrestling and to rewind it a little bit division one was always what i wanted to do in any sport and in eighth grade like i said i was a terrible wrestler by by all my own personal regard and apparently my mother and father um <laughs> but i remember sitting around the lunch table and i had a lot of friends a lot of friends that were very engrossed in I we're only about 40 minutes from Iowa City so the Iowa Hawkeyes were just the big buzz everybody loved the Hawkeyes I at the time unfortunately loved the Hawkeyes that competing against them changed my <laughs> mind but um at the time you know I'm gonna play baseball for the Hawks I'm gonna play football for the Hawks I'm gonna do this for the Hawks and I remember coming to me and I was like oh yeah yeah, yeah I'm gonna wrestle for the Hawks and they were all better wrestlers than me at the time and so they kind of looked at me and they were like no, no, you're not going to do anything in sports playing. Like, that's not really what's going to happen. So I kind of like uh, that self vow of like, no, I'm going to go to college for wrestling. Like, I'm going to go to college for wrestling. So even before I was good, I wanted to go to college for wrestling. So fast forward, Pat Ryle, the coach, he um, that came in my senior year was a former alumni of Northern Iowa, University of Northern Iowa up there in Cedar Falls. And so uh, I went on a visit. After my senior year, uh, met with the coach up there, Randy Pugh. Brad Penrith was up there leading the ship at the time, former Hawkeye. Um, and uh, it just seemed like an awesome fit. I just, and they offered me a scholarship and I, I accepted and then uh, was there for five years, got redshirted and then was a varsity starter for three years and had some fun. So awesome. Yeah. Now, it goes beyond that. You took it even further than that, right? Now you competed at, at kind of like a national level or for our world team. What's that about? So, so I qualified to that. So that was one of my turning college points was that during college, Schwabi, Doug Schwab took over. Um, he was a national champion for Iowa as well. And he came in and is to date the best person, coach, and molded me as a man uh, off the mat just as much as on the mat um, without question uh, uh, he 
was a huge influence on me to just be better than just what I can do and try to try to go further than what I even thought. And in 2011, I qualified for the uh, world team trials uh, for freestyle um, that was held down in OKC. Um, so that was, yes, I competed in freestyle and in high school, I had done Fargo, the national tournament. I was on the team, the Iowa <laughs> team for, for freestyle. Um, and I've always done off season wrestling, which for the amateur is freestyle and Greco, the Olympic and world style of wrestling. Um, and then I did qualify for the NCAA tournament in 2012, uh, as well as winning the conference title as heavyweight. So it was, it was good. It was, it was definitely some fun times. And then, um, but yeah, after I was done my senior year, um, I was done wrestling. I was done wrestling. I moved to Chicago with my wife. She had a job opportunity here and it's been, uh, nothing since, but just coaching and, and, uh, uh, doing what I can to try to apply that knowledge I learned from Doug on the mat to off the mat. So, right. yeah. So where are you nice. coaching at? I was coaching at Lane Tech. I also oh, helped a little bit in the off. My alma mater. Yeah, yeah. I, I helped a little bit in the off season, um, a year or two with uh, Northwestern, uh, with Matt Storniolo up there, and then it was just more or less just rolling around with one of their heavyweights, Conan Jennings, a great guy, and and some of the other guys no formal capacity of uh, coaching, but just kind of, you know, getting in the room and just putting hands on some kids, um, learning, meeting some really cool athletes up there. Um, and then I coached uh, on, on staff at Lane Tech for about three years and got a chance to really meet some really good kids and really help one of their heavyweights actually end up starting out as a sophomore, no wrestling experience whatsoever. Um, and it just rolled with him every day. He, he quit the basketball team to come on big football kid um, who actually ended up going playing football at Valpo, but play sixth at state in Illinois uh, his, by his senior year. So it was, it was good. Taught him a good double leg. And that was it. That was it for heavyweight. It's usually the first one to trip. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but it was good. It was very good. That's awesome. So, uh, that's good. You answered some of my questions. Like, how did you get to Chicago? And then I knew I'd heard that you coached. So I'm glad to hear, and especially yeah. happy to hear that you did lane tech. That's awesome. You know? Yeah, no, great, great, great school. The kids there are very obviously intelligent. Um, uh, just clearly the, the, the that, graduates are intelligent. Yeah. You know, they're just a pedigree. I mean, look at you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a, uh, no, it didn't mean phenomenal kids. I mean, again, I still talk to them to this day. Um, you know, four or five years off of coaching from there. And they're just still uh, good friends now. Awesome. So how do you... I'm a transplant. I think I mentioned before that I was originally from Cleveland and I moved to Chicago in 87. Great city. You know, it's, it's like Cleveland, same setup, just larger uh, geographically and um, so on. But, you know, Ohio, Cleveland especially, um, we're located... So we're like Cleveland's like a huge wrestling city, right? So arguably the greatest high school wrestling team year after year in the country is, is located right. You know, Lakewood, Ohio, um, St. Ed's. Okay. They yep. win yep. so much. Then we had, uh, another legendary coach, uh, from a, uh, uh, another just border suburb, Maple Heights, uh, uh, Mike Milkovich, okay, and the Milkoviches, the sons went, I think one or two of them became national, uh, Div 1 national champions too, champions. Um, so the Milkoviches, that, that name is, is legendary in Ohio, and, uh, and we're right near, we're like 95 to 100 miles from the border of Pennsylvania, western Pennsylvania, so we have the Ohio and Pennsylvania uh, football thing, you know, going on, so, uh, so I was like, when, so that's like, that's probably like the main difference between Cleveland and Chicago. Cleveland's more of a wrestling uh, city. And it's great to hear that a guy with your talent and you, you seem such a personable guy, like, like who wouldn't want to be coached by you? Who wouldn't want to be your friend, right? To have people like you uh, here um, coaching, even at the high school level, or even if there were younger kids, this is, this is great. Like I'm all psyched up. I can't wait to actually get to meet you in person, you know? You know, that's one of my favorite things. When I, right out of high school, I actually went straight into 
I got an opportunity to, so my wife fast forward back up a little bit. So we got out of high school or college. We're both, we've been together since we were sophomores in high school. So she went to Iowa state. She, she tells me she was too smart for uh, you and I, <laughs> I tell you what, I'm inclined to believe her. She, she, she graduated uh, magna cum laude, uh, one of the, one of the lades, whatever. She got to wear special fancy robes that I didn't even touch um, from <laughs> Iowa state with a biology and psychology major. Um, and she just was phenomenal inspiration. And this is one of the reasons why I was actually able to compete my sophomore year. Um, just for the simple fact that once I met her, I knew she wasn't going to be dating so, some bum of a guy. I needed to have aspirations um, to keep her around. So, um, and she's definitely been somebody that's just everything that I've gotten and everything that I've come across is definitely attributed to her. And, uh, uh, but she, we graduated, we went back to um, Iowa because she got an, an internship at Shedd Aquarium because she is a uh, dolphin and whale trainer at the Shedd Aquarium down here. Oh, wow. Chicago. Oh, nice. Yeah. And so she, she then needed to live here in Chicago, but I needed to make money. So I went to back to my local high school and was uh, a paraeducator for special education, as well as um, coaching the future Falcons team and a coach on the high school team. So I tried to fill my plate with wrestling and just being as best as I can to give back to my school a little bit, um, which was fun. But I loved coaching kids, kids, kindergarten through fifth grade, and then sixth through eighth. And then obviously the high school, I separate. I had three practices um, throughout the week that I would dedicate to the kids. And it was just, I want to get back to coaching um, here in the next couple of years after I get a little bit more competition with jujitsu, but I want to get back to it. I know that that's where I really get passionate about is just relaying wrestling and, and the lessons I learned again, off and on the mat and just translating it into making what my coach would say is great human beings, not just wrestlers, just beautiful human beings in life. So that's kind of why I love coaching. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we need more people like you. The whole world needs more people like you, not just wrestling. You know, it's just you sound like you got your head, you know, you're 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 going in the right direction. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate that yeah, a lot. I mean it, you know. Everybody, I really wish people had mentors, you know, like you had your coach. And yeah, I didn't with like my wrestling coach, I've said this many times. He was he taught me how to fight, all that, but we did not have that personal thing at all. And uh um, of course I was young and he was old, very old and European. And he was a survivor of a, uh, you know, a concentration camp. He was different. Uh, and, um, but as I got, when I, it wasn't until I was a grown man that I started to have these father figure types, because I didn't actually have a father. So I had these father figure types. Um, but I can't imagine what it would have been like for me if I would have had that when I was that young. Okay. Like you're doing for these kids and you're going to do it again. And I'm sure you're going to be a success. I have no doubt. I'm good with that. I can read people pretty good normally. So I got a good <laughs> vibe you. about you, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, that means a lot. So how did you find jujitsu? Yeah, there you go. Um, so jujitsu, obviously, it's kind of it's kind of simple. I've known about jujitsu since inception. My father, uh, my uh, father and mom were just huge into UFC. <laughs> UFC, you know, Matt Hughes, every Saturday, we, they would go out and watch Matt Hughes, Tim Sylvia and, and, and Davenport, Pat Miletic. Mm -hmm, so sure. uh, right there. So the I've gone there, I'd gone there a couple of times when he still had his gym to kind of roll around and just learning wrestling at the time when I was in high school. Um, but it was the wrestling classes I was more interested in because I knew jujitsu wasn't in, in college, but I had a lot of friends that were wrestlers that didn't go to college. They went into fighting. So they had jujitsu's kind of always been around in the sense that like, oh, jujitsu is an aspect of fighting, you know, not jujitsu at its core is an actual sport that far supersedes just fighting. Um, but getting into jujitsu uh, pretty more heavily was when I first met Jason, oddly enough, at uh, Conviction Fitness, Jason Bender from Bender Martial Arts. Um, he... Conviction Fitness off of Western Avenue is where I've met some lifetime friends. Um, Melody, who you guys interviewed the other day, um, as well as Jason. 
and one of my really close friends, Mitch, um, they all, they're all now at this, we're all going to Jason's club. It's kind of like a, a, a reunion of the Conviction Fitness crew since the gym has been since tore down, houses gone up and it's no longer there, but we're all kind of congregating uh, back here. Um, and I'm just getting back into it because I'm itching to stay on the mat. I took a couple little bit, little time hiatus off to get into bodybuilding. Um, did some men's physique stuff, no competitions, but worked with a trainer who really kind of showed me how to properly train muscle mind connection with weights. Um, I have a degree in kinesiology and sports focus, um, coaching and, and really the strength training that comes into that. But he showed me such a different style of training, um, just true hypertrophy work and just working the muscle doesn't need to be heavy, heavy, ridiculously heavy weight and just knowing how to move it and work every fine tune. Well, since I'm done with that now, uh, me and my buddy Mitch that I kind of just talked about, we decided, all right, we're done lifting heavy. Time to start throwing some other people around. So that's why we wanted to start getting Dick into jujitsu. He's coming in fresh, nothing, no one about wrestling. So Jason was gracious enough to allow me to have a copy of his key. So we go in around 4 30, 5 o'clock in the mornings. Um, and we'll do wrestling until the class or whatever schedule. And I'm just, I'm bitten with the, the jujitsu bug right now. And I'm hoping my addiction for wrestling transfers over pretty well. So. How are you um, transitioning to the D? I, I, um, I'm very masochistic in the way that if I don't like something, I try to make it a fix, fix on my, my focus. Um, for example, I hated front squats. Like squats in general are just terrible for just the mindset because they're just so heavy. Okay. But front squats were something where I decided to make it a front front squat party. Every time I head into the gym, it's a front squat party. We're getting we're getting after it today to the point where now front squats my favorite style of lifting squats. Okay. I'm hoping that that can be carbon copied into gi. Because <laughs> right now, <laughs> no gi is my jam. I love it. It's so easy because it's just like wrestling. Um, but I'm really trying to make it a point to just say, you know, you got to train the gi um, to learn so many different things that can be applied over to no gi very easily if you do it correctly. So um, to answer your question, I'm currently at 50-50, probably more no gi than anything. But I, the, no, the gi is starting to be a little bit fun for me. Yeah, it can be, uh, I don't know if disconcerting is the right, you know, it, it can be odd when you first grow with someone and they can really hold on to you in ways you weren't expecting, you know, yeah. they can just shut you down with grips. And yeah, uh, yeah I mean, wrestling someone, the same person in a gi and a no gi is a totally different experience, you know, uh, yeah. you know, I could, you could slip past a certain move without a gi and other ones, it's like, uh oh, they've got me stuck, you know, <laughs> it's like yeah, they got a grip on me. It gets and, so uh, frustrating. It's so, it's so frustrating in a great way. Listen, I'm, I'm not a malicious wrestler like some of the other wrestlers that you'll see. They're all about, you know, pain and suffering and just slams and everything like that. Uh, I am very meticulous in the way that I go about it. And I'm, I'm conscious of my, my weight and my size when I roll with some people. But when somebody starts annoying me with those gi things, I sometimes lose that sense of uh, <laughs> awareness and go, just smash through. <laughs> yeah. So, but I'm, again, I'm, I'm trying to learn, be a little bit smarter because smashing through sometimes also leaves me vulnerable, um, which oddly enough uh, was one of the reasons why I attribute my loss to uh, my recent tournament at no gi worlds um, in the semifinals would have got me into the finals. If I'd have been a little bit more patient and not as, not as gung ho to uh, smash through. So, let's talk a little bit about that. So, how long have you been training at Jason's? Uh, uh, about a little over three months now. So three months, and so you're already competing. Oh, without uh, question, without I feel like that's the fastest way to. I mean, obviously, again, I have I have I have years trained in wrestling. So in my mind, you know, not to say that I it, no gi jiu jitsu is coming easy to me but it is in the sense that it's coming comfortable to me. Um, and the fastest way to be uncomfortable is to put yourself in more uncomfortable positions to hopefully make that more comfortable. And I just, without question, as soon as I started going with Jason, 
I think it was a week into rolling with Jason that I go, all right, when's my next tournament that I'm going to? When's the first tournament that I'm going to do? Um, and I landed on Nogi Worlds because I said, let's go big or go home. So, um, so that's that was my main focus. And I'm still, and um, I'm actually dealing with a little bit of an injury right now. Uh, I popped a rib head out last week. Uh, the front front floater rib popped out, and I got it pushed in yes or two days ago. So I'm, I, I was able to roll for the first time in a week and a half yesterday, just lightly on the mats, and it feels a little bit better. Um, but I'm planning on barring it doesn't mess up anymore. I'm bar- planning on going right back out to California for Masters Worlds and Gi Worlds. So again, that baptism, learning to be comfortable. I'm going right into another tournament with Gi. So, so yeah. It's kind of cool. Go ahead, funny, Tony. Funny story, kind of that ties into your your rib popping out. So I'm a, I'm a senior in high school at this time, and I remember there was this one kid, who was, you know, part of the crew, you know, one of my buddies, and he was he wasn't a wrestler or anything like that, but we were goofing around in the hallway and I, you know, I did, I did something to him. Right. And yeah. uh, that, that was the end of it. No big deal. End of story. So like a couple days later, now right next door to where my high school was and Joe saw the high school right next door was believe it or not, like a abandoned, um, uh, like a mental hospital kind of thing, like a psychiatric ward. Right. But they had a little baseball diamond. So we used to cut class all the time and play softball. Right. Um, well, this is in a very, 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 very bad neighborhood, gang bang, all that stuff, really, really bad. So I'm up to bat, okay? And I swing, and as I hit that bat, you know, I scream, and I go down real quick. I couldn't even breathe. Everybody on the baseball diamond hit the deck because they thought <laughs> I got shot. Oh. They heard the th- well, my rip popped out, right? I brought yeah, my yeah, rip yeah. I couldn't breathe, so I'm and I'm I'm grasping, and they're running over me. They're crawling like I'm not running, but crawling like what's the matter? I couldn't talk. Well, so it was hysterical because everybody thought I got shot, but I didn't. <laughs> with my my rib, so I must have heard it when I was wrestling around with with Keith yeah. a couple of days before, and just just the swing, you know, yeah. popped it out. <laughs> yeah, so it actually it, it happened while I was. Uh, uh, one thing that I'm trying to really utilize is that my current job that I have, one of my current jobs that I currently have is a Midwest territory for uh, a paper company out of Pennsylvania. And um, no, it's not Scranton. It's not Dunder Mifflin, but it, it, it's close. Um, uh, so anyway, I was down in Louisville for business, but in the evening they had a 6 a.m., 6 p.m. class. And I made really good friends with the gentleman who I, I, I competed against in my semifinals match at Nogi Worlds, super good, good guy. He actually trains under Chewy Jitsu, the YouTube. Um, oh, yeah, channel. I know him. Yep. And so I went down there to go train with them. And it was one of the first lives we were going. He shot in, shoulder hit my rib as I sprawled, and I just felt it slide out just immediately. And so I kept wrestling a little bit, tried to tough it through. Then uh, we did a couple drills where they take your back and they elongate you. And I go, this probably is not the best thing to work on when you just popped a rib out. So, um, but that's kind of how it happened. Um, I continued to drill and do what I could just to not be a a wet towel, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's painful, but I got it all taken care of. I think for the most part, they did some soft tissue crassing on it on Thursday, freed up some, a little bit of the inflammation they did some adjusting. And then finally, again, I was able to pop it back in. And I'm hoping that I take it easy, but knowing me and my wife knows me better than I do, that she's trying to keep the chains on me and say, just sit home, <laughs> just relax, please, please, yeah. can you? Um, but we'll see. We'll see. But now it's not, it's not an easy, it's not, it's not easy going. So. Yeah. This isn't the injuries, man. You know that it's part of this life. It just, you can't, yeah. It's not a reflection on, on, on the athlete. It's certainly not a reflection on the coach. Just shit happens. You know, it just, yeah. you, you know, it's an inverted sometimes. Like this yeah. was an inverted. Right. Right. Well, you know, it's, it's, I'm homebound as we talked before the podcast. I can't get out, but I'm hoping in 2022, on, I mean, I'm hoping, it, it's kind of unfortunate for me to say that, but, you know, circumstances I mean, yeah. will change. And uh, you'll be on my list. You know, I want to I wanna go see uh, Jason and you and, you know, Josh Pacini. And I'd like to stop out, stop out and uh, see Rick Solo as well. Um, 
you know, maybe we all all should all get together one day and just start making like a caravan, you know, <laughs> just yeah. Jim hop, you know, but we'll see what happens. Everything is up in the air with me, but certainly look, I look forward to, you know, to meeting you in person. That's. That'd be a pleasure. Wow. No, I, I welcome yeah. that day for sure. I'm, I'm one big thing that I, I do. I do wish that I would have gotten to jujitsu a little bit earlier. Um, I do appreciate my journey as I, I come across it. I've tried to do a little bit of everything, whether it, right out of college, I did Olympic weightlifting. Um, there was a time that I thought I was going to be a professional wrestler. Um, <laughs> and that was based upon Jerry Briscoe reaching out to me and trying to recruit me to come down. They flew me down twice to the WWE Performance Center a couple of times to to try out and do like promos and do the workouts and everything like that. I got to do a promo for Dusty Rhodes before he passed. And that was uh, surreal. Um, but, you know, then Olympic weightlifting with my buddy Mitch doing a couple competitions there and then bodybuilding and then now jujitsu. But I wish I would have done it a little earlier. But the one thing I do love about it is that I'm more of a sponge. I, I, I don't, I'm not so gung ho. So when we do have the opportunity to meet Tony, I mean, just, I'm a sponge, whatever you have to divulge. I'm never too, never too shy to say that I don't know something. And I always want to learn as much as possible. So I'm excited. Yeah. It's totally different. Um, it, it yeah. Maybe on the, on the surface, some, some of the techniques maybe may look the same. It's different. So like I, I try to tell people who are not good with, uh, they're not linguistics, they're not good with languages. Um, you probably cannot tell the difference. Now, when I say you, I don't mean you, but you in general right. probably cannot tell the difference between Spanish and Italian or Polish and Russian uh, or Slovenian and Croatian because they sound similar. The rhythms may be slightly similar, similar. maybe even some words are identical, but they're not similar or they're not the same. So yeah. that's how it is with what I do. It, it, it may look, some stuff may look similar, but it's, it's not. So um, yeah, no, it's cool, man. We'll do that. Even if you're hooked, you're, even if we don't have access to a mat, just to meet you in person, you know, uh, out having a pizza or something like that. Um, don't yeah, matter. Yeah, eventually we'll get on the mat. Um, but th that's going to probably have to wait a little bit longer, but it may be quick, easier for me to just come out for, you know, half hour to say hi to people, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, no, it, it's, see, when I was a kid, there was no jujitsu. I mean, there, there was jujitsu certainly, but there wasn't access to it. Nobody certainly heard of Brazilian jujitsu. That wasn't a thing, but uh, there was no competitions. There was pro wrestling. Now you mentioned Jerry Briscoe. He was another legitimate amateur wrestler. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just like when I met, um, well, I mentioned that I was at the hall of fame uh, in Newton, Iowa, and I got to meet Vern Gagne, uh, again, another Olympian, national yeah. champ, and so yeah. on. And, you know, Vern was like, yeah, you know, he would have wanted me to wrestle back in the day when he had the AWA, which would have been kind of <laughs> neat, right? But I yeah. didn't have any, my coach told, uh, was, you know, very against me doing any sort of professional wrestling. Just don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Okay, no, so I never had right. a desire. And also, I wasn't built like I... Well, I was smaller. I was skinnier back then. So I didn't have that kind of physique anyway. Um, but uh, that was just something that, um, for me, didn't appeal. But bear in mind, too, that this is the 70s we're talking about here. Uh, and, and right around 1980, before pro wrestling got super, super huge, like with Hulk Hogan. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, I was already a grown man when all that shit was going down. So um, right. the wrestling, the pro wrestling that I saw was little things like at the like a small little arena like the yeah, arena yeah. or something yeah but uh no i look forward to, to meeting you but you know speaking <clears throat> what i do the catch wrestling back in the way back way back way back there were a lot of legitimate amateur wrestlers that excelled at professional at catch wrestling professional wrestling they worked their matches of course but some of them had legitimate skills now um, I don't even know if Joe knows this. So, for example, Joe, one of Luthez's coaches, George Tragos, was a national champion. Um, Ray Steele, whose real name was uh, Pete Sauer, he was a national champion. Uh, Nat Pendleton, who was an Olympic silver medalist and, of course, a national champion, he did, he did pro wrestling. Um, 
and I, and there's others too that were actually very good legitimate amateur wrestlers that 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 turned pro. Um, more didn't, of course. Most of them. I mean, there's just a handful that actually did. But uh, but yeah, there was that lineage of these guys being uh, yeah, you know, crossing yeah. over into the pro wrestling world back back. I was then. in a group. I was in a group with a lot of other uh, heavyweight wrestlers that he was he was recruiting to come down. So when I went down there, it was a who's who of, oh, you're a D two national champ, you're a D one wrestler. You're so it was it was definitely a, a theme that they wanted athletic wrestlers to come down. And oddly enough, you see the most recent one that you're going to see. I'm I'm assuming is Gabe Steven Gable Stevenson from uh, 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 Minnesota, our, our one twenty five kilogram champion for this year in the Olympics. He had, from what I remember, it may be rumors, but I think he just signed a contract to actually um, go on to do professional wrestling when he's done. So we'll, well see nice. him. Well, Bob Backlund was a national champ, D2. Oh, wrestling. yeah. But, yep, yep, yep. Uh, of course, Kurt Angle, everybody knows him. But there, yeah. I, I hate dropping names because you know what happens with me? I forget people, and I don't, I don't mean any disrespect if I don't mention, you know, uh, uh, you know, like the guy that I forgot what his real name is, but Baron Von Raschke, you know, he used to have, oh, yeah, yeah. To, he was a national, I believe he was the national Greco Roman champ. Yep. Uh, yeah. Again, see, I hate, I hate doing this. Chris Taylor tried his oh. hand, his hand at pro wrestling, you know, the big 400 pounder that got souped in the, in the Olympics. You know, you know, the story of that, don't you? And the, and the, when the uh, Russian came out, when they got oh, to no. Munich, throw it out at us, tell us. So, so, and, and I can't remember, I just remember the story in the regard that, so they knew that they were coming in into Munich in the 72 Olympics when, um, when the U S arrived, that wrestler who had to wrestle Chris Taylor had walked up to him, put his, hugged him. Well, Chris Taylor is this big lovey dovey, like, Hey, Hey, how are you? We love friends. Yada, yada. He was a very nice, gentle giant. And he just thought the guy was hugging him. The guy just was rapping to see if he could get his arms around him. No, wow. He could get his arms around him and then walked out and just left. And then within 20 seconds of the match, boom, took him over and pinned him. He knew as soon as he get his arms around him, he was going to throw him. You know, and that is one of the most iconic photographs in wrestling history. Yeah. It was you on know, my wall. It was on my wall. back arch. God bless it, man. Him and Crowling. Alexander Crowling. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, they're both on, they were both on my wall. Wow. So, yeah. Well, I knew a guy, uh, he was a runner up D2 champ, Howard Lawson from California. He wrestled at 68, I think. Um, so he wasn't a big guy, but he, he was really a Greco guy, Greco, Greco, Greco. He could yeah. do back arches that would blow your mind. Um, he would take like, like literally, um, less than a step, like a, like a foot, he would put his foot up against the wall and then, then half of that back it off and he could back arch his flexibility in his in his low back um he in his late 30s i think um mid to late 30s he wrestled uh he used to wrestle um the uh senior nationals every year he won a few times he wrestled uh a much younger tito ortiz three times and he beat tito twice two out of three times and he wasn't yeah. even training anymore that's yeah, how good yeah, the wrestler yeah. howard lawson was yeah it's, it's definitely a different breed. Once you wrestle, I mean, it's one of those beautiful, once you've wrestled, everything else in life is easy. One of the most famous quotes. Um, and, and that can ring true for a lot of things, depending on how in depth you were with wrestling. But especially when you go into wrestling, you have it hardwired in your brain, you just learn how to move different. And it can just save so much energy. And that can just wear your opponents down, no matter what age they are, what skill level they are. It's, it's a obviously a testament to the gentleman you just talked about he's not going to miss a step no matter how old he is no yeah I, i've lost touch with him because i don't know how to get in touch with him anymore but uh his brother stevie lawson was uh united states national greco champ and ironically stevie lawson was the best man at um randy couture's wedding oh no were, kidding oh yeah 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 so i mean there's always, there's, there's these tentacles, everything ties in, yeah. you know, uh, it, so like the same with the boxing world, you know, uh, this person knows that person knows that yeah. person. Knows. It's a community. It's, it's, it, such, it a, it's it, such a network of, of folks. I mean, it's crazy because it's, my ears are a precursor. My wife always kind of just like rolls her eyes whenever I'm walking because either they, they think I'm a wrestler, a box or a, a fighter first and foremost, a wrestler, a boxer, but 
if two guys see each other with the ears, it's kind of like, oh, hey, what's, what's going on? You're like, you, you talk, you, you know, and then all of a sudden, yeah. you know, this guy, know that guy, you know, all of a sudden you're like, oh, we almost trained at the same place, you know, like it's, it's pretty cool. It's, it's a huge, you can, you could waste an hour talking to some random person um, within a wrestling community easily. It's just drop you everything. Know, I used to have a, my right ear used to be a pretty bad cauliflower ear. So I, I was dating somebody, this is years ago, who she just demanded that I get it fixed. Well, he did his best. It's yeah, still yeah. kind of messed up. I lost a piece of my ear, actually. Um, you'll see it when you meet me. You'll, you'll be able to see it. But so segue, uh, I don't know, maybe five years ago, I happened to be in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's like yeah. a little. So I, I'm at this place called Champs with my friend to get lunch, right? A hamburger and french fries or whatever. So there's this big dude, um, younger guy, uh, I don't know if he was the manager or whatever, but he was behind the bar. Um, he had a cauliflower ear and shit. So I'm doing what you're doing. I'm talking about, I'm talking about wrestling and fighting. And he's just, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. So after about two minutes, I'm like, so where'd you wrestle at? He goes, oh, I, I never wrestled. I don't do any, any sort of thing. I'm like, well, what's up with the ear? He's like, oh man, I was, I was bouncing and somebody popped me in the head. <laughs> That's it. He never, he never wrestled. Never did any martial arts. He's he probably saying. gets that all the time. He probably right. gets that all the time. People just coming up and bearing their wrestling soul to him, and right. he's like, "Why are all these wrestlers talking to me?" <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> you know, what he's I mean. got the he's got the key to the castle with those things. Yeah. Oh man, and how? Yeah. Um, you know, but when my coach, when I was a kid, he had he had a cauliflower ear, just one ear, right? And it was um ugly well he was just a scary looking guy so i always remember like the fear right oh just i don't want to talk about halloween i mean he looked like a halloween <laughs> thing right yeah i didn't want that so eventually you know you get it well not yeah. everybody gets it but you know i got it and then um yeah my brother never got it he wrestled he wrestled in college for a couple of years as well and he wrestled his whole high school he never got it so, no yeah. no he but there was a pro wrestler named terry funk okay and yep. he had a brother named dory funk well Yep. Terry Funk, I'll never forget this, this interview, and it was a shoot kind of thing. I mean, it wasn't anything like he wasn't revealing anything, but he's like, he was going off on all these, you know, assholes, as he called them, that had their cauliflower ears, how funky they look and all that. And he, he, um, you know, he, well, every time I would get it, I would get it drained right away. Well, I believe I still didn't have, I still had mine when I read the, read, read this interview and I'm like, oh, well, I, I'm proud, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, what a wimp he is and then of course you know i meet a girl who's like tony you know <laughs> you gotta get that fixed i'm like okay yes dear <laughs> yeah yeah no i my wife definitely never gave me any grief for it but she also definitely thought it was a little gross so she never had to <laughs> drain it i'd asked her a couple times to drain it when we were younger but she uh she always declined she goes no i'm not touching your ear so so yeah do you know in the old days now i I don't think this is a lie because two different wrestlers that didn't know each other told me this, but the old timers used to drain them with leeches. I heard that before, but I'd never actually physically seen that, but I heard that before, but not from somebody who said I've done it. It was more of like, I heard somebody did this. So I don't know the truth to it. I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't either. Yeah. I mean, I know I that I have, I still have needles. I, my, it's funny. Cause my, when I first had them, I have insulin needles that my grandmother gave me that I just have a pack of them ready to just pull out whenever it hasn't swelled up in a while. So I don't have to really mess with it. But the quickest one for me was just needle, just a yeah, right. little 10, 10 gauge, a little needle and should be fine. But yeah, leeches, that'd be another one. I'd be more worried about the parasites or anything I'd catch from that. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I, I, it, ooh, I just kicked my table here. I think there, there may be a grain of truth. I mean, I know that's sure. from what I read that doctors did use leeches for other things back, you know, in the 1800s or 1900s. Who knows? But, well, the sick, yeah. the sick puppies that are wrestlers that put themselves or any grapplers that put themselves through the torture of wrestling, I'm sure have done some weird things like that. So oh. I, I wouldn't put it past it. So, yeah. I had a guy, Joe knows. I Well, I don't know if Joe knows him. Brian knows him, but um, we were working out at my old gym years ago at Stone Park. And he's like, I need you to do me a favor. I'm like, yeah, sure. I don't want to mention his name. I don't want to embarrass him. But he's like, uh, I'm like, what can I do for you? He's like, I want a cauliflower ear. I want you just please guys, just, just do it. Right. Just do it. I'm like, man, I, I don't want, man, I don't want to do that. He's like, no, man, come on. 
All right, so I was a guy that I held him down while everybody was grinding on him and shit. <laughs> he's screaming. At one point, he's screaming, screaming. He's like, I can't take it anymore. Tony, you try it. Please, Tony, please, coach, coach. Well, it just didn't happen. I mean, yeah. he just couldn't get one. And yeah. now I found out not too long ago, I think Brian was telling me or something, that this guy's been in, like, movies and shit. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, he's emailed me a few times, but I have not seen him personally probably in close to 20 years, I would think, or something like that. But I'll never oh, forget yeah. that, man. He wanted that cauliflower ear bad. That had limited his choices for sure if he'd had that cauliflower ear on what roles he could play or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, I guess CGI now, they can make your ear look like anything. But I would think I would not want to have cauliflower ear rolling into an audition. So, Well, yeah. I remember when I saw Rocky for the first time in 1976 and Mickey, the boxer, his trainer, yeah. Mickey, yeah. Burgess Meredith was, was actually from Cleveland, but – he um he had a fake you know they they did the makeup the the, the cauliflower ear thing uh, for him and it looked it looked legit you know uh, yeah. so there's no reason if you're an actor you know to purposely so if anybody's out there thinking about acting and wanting to get the cauliflower ear you don't need to <laughs> they can make it look <laughs> like one. there you go yeah but oh, you know boxers good. used to get that you know my grandfather had a slight cauliflower ear from boxing back then they slipped. Boxing now was an outside art more than anything. It used to be like inside and they, the, the arms would go past their head like this and they slip real tight. And sometimes, you know, they get that. Um, plus the lack, a lot of guys back then in the, in the training didn't use headgear, but I will tell you guys this. Um, and if you guys may not believe this, but I'm sure if you can find the, the clip, you'll, you'll, you'll know that I'm, I'm right. When Riddick Bowe fought, I believe it was maybe the first or second match with Andrew Galata. Galata gave him a cauliflower ear. Okay, it, it happened because after the fight, while they were still in the ring, they were interviewing Riddick Bowe. And while he was being interviewed, he kept, you know, you could see him grabbing after the ear. So he, he was in pain already. It was swelling up and probably burning his ass and everything. But for sure, if you guys can ever see a clip of that, uh, of the fight, Look at the interview afterwards if you can find it. You'll see that he got that cauliflower ear. Of course, he got it drained because um, the next time I saw Bo, he didn't have it. So he must have yeah, gotten yeah, it taken yeah, care yeah. of right away. But uh, yeah, just a concussion, just a, you know, um, you know how it is. You, you've yeah. had him, you know. Yeah. yeah, for sure. It can happen in a variety of ways. I noticed yesterday, bro, uh, Bruce, or uh, Joe, that Brian. Brian, even though I don't think he's wrestled much anymore, he's he still had he had a you could tell he had some uh, some shit going on. Oh, I didn't notice. I thought you told me at one point that Bruce, uh, who wrestled through college, but he wanted he would rub a phone on his. Yeah, ear. he would rub his phone. <laughs> he couldn't get one. Well, look at Javier. Javier really doesn't have one, and he's you know he's a world champion. You know, twenty five thousand times over already. You know, he doesn't. Yeah. So it's just some guys are more susceptible to it than others. Um, for those out there, like, you know, I don't, I wouldn't, like, I know people want to get them, you know, I don't know. When you get to be my, like, I got these tattoos, right? These tattoos mean something to me, at least. Some of them, they're all wrestler, uh, re re relating to wrestling or fighting. But I got one that I shouldn't have gotten. And then I had to cover it up and I shouldn't have done that. So, you know, I, I kind of have regrets with the tattoos so uh, you know i i think i'm, I'm kind of glad that i did it in a way get my ear taken care of when i did um especially now at my age because you know i get looked at when i when i was still able to go out i'd have guys in their 20s and 30s staring at me anyway so i can imagine if i had an ear yeah they'd even you know more like looking for shit you know well, i'm surprised with that story though that the first thing she picked to fix on you was the ear <laughs> okay joe this is a sunday this is a family show you dirty mind guy you <laughs> i don't like you anymore no i mean i was a i'm a basket case if a woman like his his wife blaine's wife has a degree in psychology i would never she would never leave me, let me out of the house we'd be she'd be analyzing me day in and day out around the spot oh my god I could oh be yeah yeah I, no she uh she definitely takes some ribs at me but for the most part she's she's a sweetheart she's uh she she's awesome yeah that's good to hear you know um and i and I, i'm just i never met her so i don't i'm just joking but probably oh, yeah. there's like I, I i've known some people because i i i didn't do what she did but i, I mean i did take 
I studied some psychology, REBT actually. And it's funny because um, it's like this for these people, these counselors that were like my uh, um, instructors, I guess you'd say, they were like, <clears throat> it's a job to them. So when they were off of work, you know, they didn't want to talk shop. They didn't want to do right. this. Or that. It's kind of like auto mechanics. Like every mechanic I ever knew always drove like a piece of shit car. I mean, you know, they were like, 15 year old junkers, right? It's like right. They work on cars every day. They don't want to work on their own car, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I would imagine if I had a woman in my life that was a psychologist or psychiatrist, she wouldn't want to be working on me. <laughs> it's too much of a project, man. <laughs> right, right, right. No, so, what do, you, uh, what do you do for, uh, let's, hey, you know, forget about all this fighting, wrestling shit. What are some of your hobbies? What do you like to do that's got nothing to do with any of that jazz? <sighs> well, um, all right. Well, first off, I'll tell you a little bit about what I do for work. So uh, job number one of four, uh, I got four jobs that I do pretty mm -hmm. regularly. Uh, one is I'm a territory manager for a Midwest paper company, or I'm sorry, uh, a Northeast paper company out of Lewistown, Pennsylvania, right in central PA, um, okay. just north, just south of State College. Been doing that for about six years. Uh, basically, what I do is I sell towels and tissue to distributors around the Midwest area. Was hired on for Chicago area. Um, been doing that. Uh, then after that comes personal training. I actually try to do a little bit of what my college degree was in. So I do some <laughs> personal training. Um, only about three or four hours a, uh, on a good busy week, about three or four hours a week. But for the most part, it's just about four or five clients that I see. Uh, every week, you know, early mornings, late evenings, and on the weekends. Um, and then I am a real estate agent. I got that during the pandemic. Uh, you know, that was something that sales made sense to me. Um, and more than that was just helping folks. Um, and really, when I do my real estate, or when I do my sales in general, I'm very much in the vein that like, I try to sell, I'll talk somebody out of something. And if I can talk you out of it, it's not right. So I'll give you the negatives before I give you all the positives, you know, and that's what, how I approach it with real estate. I'll say, okay, you know, go take a look at a place and I'll say, you know, this, look at this, look at that, look at that. That's not okay. You got to think about this. Um, and if they love it and they're just like, you know what, I can take it in spite of that, then that's a choice that they made. And it's not a choice that I imposed upon them. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I like doing real estate was just buying a home is a huge investment and just trying to make sure that people understand that instead of it just being something that's expected to be the next step in your life. Um, and then lastly, is I'm the president of my condo association, which we just recently got a great um, rep so that it was a busy job until this person took over. So that one I can kind of put on the back burner and not have to worry about as much, but. but Are yeah. you living actually in Chicago or a burb? Oh, no, I live in Rogers park, Rogers edge, right there near yeah, Edgewater yeah. and Rogers park. So, yeah. Gotcha. yeah, nice area. Yeah, You're like yeah. the end. You're like, that's it, you know. Exactly. I'm at the first stop. Yeah. So um, and and we don't know what we want to do. Uh, we've been here for going on eight years. Um, I love Chicago. Um, that was our biggest city. We're only two and a half, three hours from our hometown. And uh, we've always come up to Gurney for six flags. Uh, our field trips coming into the city were always to Lincoln Park Zoo. Uh, mm -hmm. to the shed, to the Museum of Science and Industry, all that other stuff. So we've always come into Chicago and really enjoyed it. I had family that lived in Naperville. Um, and, and so I do love Chicago. Um, we came from 150,000 population area in Davenport in the Quad Cities. You know, it's, it's one of the bigger cities in Iowa, apart from Des Moines. Um, but I think, I think me and my wife would thrive better in that middle to like super crazy Chicago to all the way to like, you know, in the middle between Davenport. And so we're, we're, we love where we're at, but we think that we, in the next couple of years, we'll probably start migrating to a little bit smaller community. Um, okay. Just I'd like a yard. I would, I would like a yard. <laughs> so yeah. um but no, you can come over and cut my yard. <laughs> there, <laughs> there we go. Um, but as far as hobby goes, um, you know, my job keeps me kind of busy to really enjoy any set kind of hobby. I do kind of what me and Joe were talking about earlier was I do enjoy reading comic books, um, whether it's the Marvel series. I'm a DC fan, um, first and foremost with Batman. Um, but uh, 
I, I, you know, Marvel has taken over the threshold in the MCU and the cinematic version. And it's just one hit after another with that. And it's fun to read the comic books leading up to uh, the, the, the series that they're going to phase now for of the MCU. So it's, I would say reading comic books is probably a big fun thing for mine. But other than that, I love doing jujitsu and training. That's that's what my hobby is, really. That's at the end of the day. That's that's what gives me relief. I have a birthday coming up um, on the twenty seventh, and my wife every year she always asks me, like, you know, what do you want to do? And I say, or what do you want to do, or what do you want for present? And I said, bears, it's in the Chicago Bears, baked goods, <laughs> Batman, and now I can add another B and. Brazilian jiu-jitsu like that's that's <laughs> so that's all you know so um so no I I I plan to get a, a birthday roll like it's just that's just what really calms me down whether I'm traveling somewhere I have an anytime fitness membership so I love the availability just to pop in and get a workout and it's such a distressor and such a positive thing for me that I I, I enjoy that's my hobby so did nice. you say your, your birthday was uh November 27th 27th I'm 28th. Oh, there you go. There you go. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. And oh, Joe, wow. Johnny, Johnny Rice is the 29th. Wow. Crazy. You, you don't think... know Johnny Rice, uh, Blaine, but it's, it's somebody that Joe and I know. He used to be my oh, roommate. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. You, you probably know this, Blaine, but I was always jealous of people for the 27th because you have, uh, that was Jimi Hendrix's birthday and Bruce Lee's birthday. So I, I did not know it was Bruce Lee's birthday. Yeah, I'm almost 100% sure that's true because I always missed it by one day. I was like, I did know about it. Jimmy. I did know about Jimmy, but I did not know about uh, Bruce Lee. That's, that's I'm interesting. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, double check. Google me on that, but I'm pretty sure. I remember as a kid being like, come on, one day. <laughs> yeah, and it's actually crazy that you say that because I've got, I've got several friends that I've known, and, and actually my little sister um, is on the 28th, but I have met so many people that are 28, 29th, 26th, and I've very rarely met anybody who's on the 27th. And so it's, it's yeah. So no, very huh. cool. But yeah. I, I want to think that there's somebody else that I know that their birthday is, is in November. That's, you know, I don't know, but I, but Johnny's is the 29th. He, he will be sure to remind me of that, but um, <laughs> I can't, I can't go see him. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting. I'm in June, so uh, I got a long way to go yet <laughs> for, my, for my next birthday. I don't mind. I'm getting old. I'm almost 60 years old. I don't care. Uh, yeah. I, I don't see. Here's the thing: when I'm, uh, I don't like want to be strong or tough for a 60 year old. I want to be strong and tough for a 25 year old, right? I don't age doesn't that shit don't matter to me. Yeah. You know, strength is strength. I never looked at it like. Well, he's strong for being 40 or, you know, when I, no, strong is strong. So I, I still want to be an absolution. It's an absolution. There's a standard. It is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So, uh, but yeah, when you get to be my age, you are limited, you know, you don't have, the body doesn't respond like it used to. Uh, the mind doesn't either, either but I'm not going to be one of those guys that's just going to let themselves go. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm dying now that I, I can't go to the gym because I can't leave the house right now and that's killing me so i try to still maintain my uh my physique and my uh my weight uh you know it'll fluctuate a couple of pounds no big deal that's nothing but you know i'm not going to sit around and become 300 pounds when, no. when i really need to be i'm a 220 pounder well you never met me so you don't know but i'm like 220 that's what i normally so i try to be between 215 225 that's my little range there um so yeah, as long as I'm there, you know, that much is happy. I'm happy. Uh, but yeah, you sound like my kind of people, man. I love your enthusiasm. When I was your age and even older, all the way up until maybe um, till my life really kind of fell apart when I was around 50 or, you know, like when my best buddy got killed in a plane crash, I lost my gym because of that. That, that was like going to be five years ago. That's really when my life plummeted because you know, I couldn't go to my gym any hour I wanted to anymore because I didn't have it, right? So I couldn't lift. I could. I lost my best buddy. You know, I lost all my equipment. So my whole life is really uh, shit can since then. And then, of course, with my mom and 
you know, I had a divorce and all of this, you know, it's been chaotic, but as long as I'm around people like you, Joe, Jason, for as a matter of fact, those types of people keep me young. So I'm missing you guys. I can't wait to get back to Chicago, even if it's just once a week, man, to just hang out and, you know, be around the world again for an hour. Yeah, no, that's great. No, I, I, the infectiousness that, that is Jason and what kind of stemming around there. Like I said, I have a couple core people that I like to align myself with. And um, one of those people is Jason. I mean, oh, and, sure. and the atmosphere that he brings to his, his school. I mean, it's just, it is great. And then obviously I've got my other person who I've now encompassed Mitch Palicki. Um, I kind of uh, touched on him a little bit earlier, but I met him at conviction fitness He's just a great dude. Um, just been throughout everything he's been the most constant person i've i've talked to through my whole chicago life because i look at it as that, as that is that my chicago life this last day i've made friends and and family essentially he's he's like a brother to me and i've gotten him to migrate towards jason and really be a part of that as well and they knew each other obviously but um yeah so it's it, having people that are of like mind and like, you know, attitudes just makes it so much easier to accomplish your day to day. And it's just great. Yeah. It, it's, it's for me because I know that I'm permanently, well, for now, permanently detached from that. I try to not think on it because it's frustrating. Okay. Um, for me. So I, I detach myself from that world as much as I can. Otherwise, I'll drive myself nuts, yeah, you know, yeah, by yeah. missing it. But it's it's now getting overwhelming, you know, the desire again for me to be around not just the martial arts and you guys in Chicago, but just the, the other people that I know. The isolation of I've been living out here as long as you've been in Chicago. It'll be eight years that I've been in this McHenry County area. And, you know, it's not for me. This is I'm not cut out for this area. So, yeah. um, you know, the sooner that I can get back, to the city uh and and truly i'm technically 57 right so i'll be 58 in june so i want to spend the rest of my life however long or short that is um you know in chicago that's where i want to be you know that that I, you know i'm different than you in the fact that you're young you're you're married you got all of that that's all I, that's all passed me by you know so i'm at the the end here so i'm i'm looking at things a little bit differently. I want to have that access to good pizza, you know, <laughs> and good food in general, yeah. and, and yeah. Uh, you know, be around my goombas while while I can, and uh, you know, but you know, we're gonna have to start wrapping this up. But I got to tell you, we've had a lot of guests on on this show, uh, with the exception of two, which was uh, Nico's brother, who I never met, and Rick Solo, who I never met. Um, you're now the third person. Um, that I never met. And, uh, but my God, I want you back on. You are just such a nice guy. It's so, see, this frustrates me now because if I was able to get out, I'd be like, hey man, listen, let's end this podcast. I'm going to hop in a car. I'll be down <laughs> at your place in an hour and a half, you yeah, know, yeah. because you, you got that kind of personality. So I, I mean, shit. This I welcome is that. I welcome that anytime. Oh, yeah, it'll happen. Without, yo, for sure. For sure. I'm very excited. And thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I mean, I mean, yeah. Uh, and trust me, I'm going to go and uh, get back into work as soon as this, this thing gets bummed up. Uh, I'll be back to work and get you more content to talk about, whether that's titles, go do a couple more things. Like I said, I'm a blue belt right now. Um, I was just gracious enough to get it from Jason uh, about two months ago. Um, and I just, I'm just excited. I'm just excited to get back out there. I'm 31. I've got good, good years left of competition. I know that I try to take care of my body so that I can prolong it. And, uh, that's, uh, the thirties was spent, like I said, me and my buddy, we both decided the thirties is when we were going to collect titles on some things. So that's kind we're of what, in we your corner. That's what we want to do. Joe, Joe, Joe has spoken about you, uh, to me for quite a while. And, uh, you know, I can tell you, I'm in your corner, anything I can do to help, or just, even if it's moral support, you got that in spades coming from me, pal. Thank you. No, I appreciate that so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Joe, any closing thoughts on your, uh, on your end? No, that's uh, just really excited. This is a, a, a great, uh, I would say almost inspirational story in some ways. I think your attitude of like, you know, um, just having worked with you a little bit trained at Jason's, I, you know, my assumptions were completely wrong. I thought, well, this is a guy who's just, you know, maybe gifted at it, you know, and it came naturally when it was exact, the exact opposite. In some ways it was a great 
a lesson to a lot of us out there who like grappling doesn't come naturally, you know, to everybody. And you're like, you know what? Uh, you're going to kick me off the team and I'm still going to show up for practice. Yeah. You know, I'm going to lose my entire first year and I'm still going to show up. Uh, I think that that uh, was a great takeaway. And I, so I said, it was really inspirational. Uh, cool talking with you. Uh, I definitely look forward to, honestly, you know, I'll make my pitch. Obviously uh, we want to recruit you to kind of come out and learn some of our stuff too, the catch stuff. It's, yeah. it's, it'll, it's basically stuff that'll get you kicked out of every other tournament. <laughs> what, we do is, what we do is very illegal and dirty everywhere else. So uh, you yeah. won't get titles with it, uh, but. Oh, that's uh, not true. I mean, Javier's got. Well, you'll have to, you'll, you'll have to censor quite a lot of what we yeah. do. Um, and also because you want to be a teacher and a coach, because we need people who are going to, who are committed to taking this knowledge onto the next generation. You're not just doing it for yourself. You know, uh, you're, you're gathering this information to pass it on because in my opinion, it's valuable information. It's information that can save your life basically, you know, in a pinch. And it's stuff that was passed down graciously to Tony from, you know, uh, you know, someone basically who took him under his wing and we just need to, we need more people to take on this lineage, especially if you have a wrestling background, because then you have the foundation, uh, you know, you don't have to work at that. So uh, looking forward to that. So I guess yeah. I have a lot of, and also I think we should have a podcast just where we talk about comics because I didn't really even get to touch the surface. <laughs> and yeah, Done. don't, don't Done. get me going. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely send you some recommendations and some pictures of some of my stuff, but I, I, yeah, I, I've, spent some of my later years collecting some really cool stuff so um oh, that, that'll cool. be the next podcast where we can bore we can bore tony talking about comics <laughs> <laughs> well you gotta yeah. get ron you gotta get ron on the dude you have to meet ron omari uh i'm sorry i know we're trying to wrap this pot but blaine he has like uh the first issue of the avengers he has amazing fantasy 15 i mean he has comics that are worth i mean tens of oh, thousands yeah. of dollars and, oh. I mean, well, my it, tattoo, this tattoo was, well, actually, it, yes, this one was drawn by uh, Barry Crane from Chicago. Is that Wolverine? No, this is just a tiger. No, this is a tiger on a man. Oh, on a oh okay. I, got, I saw the boots. I saw the boots, and I was like, is that a Wolverine? Uh, this, is, this is one and done thing. It's, <laughs> it's my, like, my logo, company logo. But yeah. Barry did the, uh, he drew Spider-Man, okay? That for, oh, yeah, yeah. For that. yeah. So this is, so... Uh, so you guys are all I, no problem with your comics. I get it, but it's gotta be stuff. I mean, I got the real deal here. I got <laughs> artists. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, I got something. Oh, oh wait, I gotta put my do that again. Say something, Blaine. You gotta zoom in on. You. Can you see it? No, I can't. He's. No, I, see I, got the, I got the. I don't know if you can see it. I got the Batman logo on the inside of my lip. Wow. Oh my God. <laughs> wow, I, got, I got a couple tattoos that's the only one that's actually a, a batman logo it's a buddy of mine was doing another thing and it took him two minutes to just real black ink it'll be gone it'll be gone in you know five six years it's already faded um but it was something funny i'm a, I'm a big batman nut so i uh i told him to do it so it was fun i dated a girl named robin once that matters. There we go. There we go. It's all full circle. We're fine. We're back yeah, right. on track. <laughs> all right. Well, guy, we'll see you soon. And uh, so everybody, we'll, I'll see you next week for sure uh, with Joe. We'll see what's up with Nico. Um, we'll, we'll see if we're going to have a special guest or we may have a subject matter that we should talk about next week, I think. Um, but regardless, it was a pleasure meeting a new friend. Thank you. Likewise. I appreciate it so much, guys. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you.